Personally, I'm not a good shopper, and I'm not a good cook either. But fortunately, HelloFresh make things so easy for me. They deliver right to my door and have a brilliant selection of very healthy, low-calorie, carb-smart, vegetarian and pescatarian options. Plus, every recipe is packed with fresh produce, sourced directly from farmers. They also provide these brilliant recipe cards that even I can follow. And today I'm making Middle Eastern-style veggie harissa tacos. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and prepping so you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in just about 30 minutes or even 20 minutes with their quick and easy options. The pre-portioned ingredients also means there's less prep for you and less wasted food and you can easily change your delivery days or food preferences and skip a week whenever you need. It really is that easy. I was really pleased to learn that during 2020, HelloFresh donated over 4 million meals to charity and is continuing to step up their food donations. HelloFresh has certainly made my cooking and shopping experiences so much better. So if you would like to try some of the delicious HelloFresh recipes, all you have to do is go to HelloFresh.com and use my code BRIEFCASE14 to get 14 free meals, including free shipping. Today we are looking at a case from the second part of the 18th century. So sit back as we go to the USA. Bathsheba Ruggles was born on the 13th of February 1745 in Banstable County, Massachusetts. Her father was the prominent Brigadier General Timothy Ruggles, a very wealthy gentleman who worked as an attorney and had held the position of Chief Justice at the Worcester Court of Common Pleas from 1762 to 1764. He was also a delegate to the Stamp Act Congress in 1765. He was very loyal to the Crown and to the British in North America. Bathsheba was the second youngest of her parents' children, and many believed that she was her father's favourite. Life was relatively easy for her, living in a splendid house, with fine clothes, and educated by a governess. In 1765, Bathsheba was introduced to a gentleman named Mr Joshua Spooner. Her parents considered him to be a very good marriage prospect for their daughter. He was the third son of a wealthy Boston merchant and owned a number of properties. On the 15th of January 1766, when she was still just 20 years old, Bathsheba Ruggles and Joshua Spooner were married. They lived in a nice house in the small town of Brookfield and were looked upon as a very respectable couple. They would attend church and when out walking together, would politely acknowledge the other residents as they passed in the street. Bathsheba's very charming nature soon made her a popular member of the Brookfield community. On the 8th of April 1767, the couple's first child was born. Three years later in 1770, Bathsheba again gave birth, but tragically, their son named John died at just a few weeks old. This was not uncommon, as in the latter part of the 18th century, the infant mortality rate was estimated to be in excess of 15%. Over the next five years, Bathsheba gave birth to two more children. During these years, rumours began to emerge amongst the Brookfield residents that the marriage of the wealthy Mr Joshua Spooner and his charming wife was not going very well. Although they would put on the appearance of a contented and loving couple who were devoted to their children, it was said that Joshua would often get drunk and be abusive to Bathsheba. There were also whispers that he had engaged in relationships with household servants. Another reason that the marriage may not have been harmonious was because at the time there was great tension between the 13 colonies on the east coast of North America and the British Crown. But Sheba's father, Mr Timothy Ruggles, was loyal to the British, while her husband and family supported the ambitions of the 13 colonies. In 1774, her father and other members of her family left their home and fled to Canada. Bathsheba now seemed somewhat alone. She had three young children to look after and felt that her husband did not treat her with respect. She described her feelings towards him as utter aversion. In March 1777, a young soldier in the Continental Army named Ezra Ross 
was walking home to his village near Ipswich in Essex County, Massachusetts, when he suddenly became ill. It was not uncommon for soldiers to feel unwell during the American Revolution. Diseases such as smallpox, malaria and dysentery were all commonplace amongst both the colonial and the British soldiers, so much so that more soldiers died from disease and infections than on the battlefield. It was more than 250 miles from his encampment in Morristown, New Jersey, to the small village where Ezra grew up. As he wearily arrived in Brookfield, it became apparent that he was too weak and too ill to continue his journey. The Spooners took pity on the young soldier and invited him to rest in their house. Bathsheba spent the next few weeks nursing him back to health. As he began to recover, Ezra started to accompany Bathsheba out riding. She seemed quite taken by him. Even though at 32 years old, she was twice his age. He eventually made his way home, but returned to Brookfield in July 1777, when on his way back to his regiment. Ezra was again invited to stay at the property, following the surrender of the British General John Burgoyne and his army at Saratoga. But soon after, he became romantically involved with the lady of the house, Mrs Bathsheba Rugglespooner. Her husband Joshua also asked the young man to accompany him on business trips, seemingly unaware that Ezra Ross was involved in a relationship with his wife. Bathsheba soon discovered that she was pregnant, and this caused her great concern. Her marriage had not been going well for a good while, and she worried that when her husband found out that she was with child, he would realise that she had been engaged in an improper relationship. At the time, adultery was a crime that was punishable, and Bathsheba could be stripped to the waist and receive 30 lashes. These would be administered in public in the town square. She would then undoubtedly be treated as an outcast by the good people of Brookfield. Even if her husband didn't want all the scandal associated with an adulterous wife, he would be sure to make her life even more unbearable than it already was. She thought about what she could do. Obtaining a divorce was extremely difficult, especially for women. It was also considered to show personal and moral failings. People believed that stable marriages promoted social order and someone from such a high standing family like Joshua Spooner would almost certainly not get divorced. But she could not allow him to know that she was carrying another man's child. She decided that the only option available to her was to kill her husband. In February 1778, Joshua Spooner travelled to Princeton, Massachusetts and asked Ezra Ross to join him. For some reason, Joshua liked it when young Ezra accompanied him. The two gentlemen were to visit a business that Joshua owned. However, unbeknown to Joshua Spooner, Ezra had brought with him a bottle of nitric acid. He had been given this by Joshua's wife Bathsheba. She had instructed him to add it to her husband's drinks. Ezra had never been comfortable with this arrangement and decided not to go through with it. Instead, when their business was completed in Princeton, he returned to his village. During her husband's absence, Bathsheba had invited two British soldiers into her house. Due to the heavy defeat suffered by the British on the battlefields, many had deserted and dispersed throughout the East Coast. The two soldiers were Private William Brooks and Sergeant James Buchanan. Both men arrived in Brookfield exhausted and hungry so Bathsheba took them in. She had much sympathy for the soldiers, as her father had always been a supporter of the British in America, so she was happy to provide the two men with food and shelter. After a few days in her house, she told them of her plan to kill her husband. She told them that if they assisted her, they would both be rewarded. Meanwhile, they stayed in her home, enjoying her hospitality. Eventually, Joshua Spooner returned to Brookfield, he was not pleased to find two British deserters staying in his home. After all, he supported the 13 colonies who had fought against the Crown. He told them that they could not stay in his house, so the two men prepared to leave. Bathsheba, however, persuaded them to stay in Brookfield, saying that she would support them financially and then reward them once her husband was dead. Bathsheba then wrote to Ezra Ross and asked him to return as soon as he was able. The young man duly arrived on the 28th of February. The next day, Sunday the 1st of March 1778, 
Joshua Spooner went out to his local tavern. This was something he did quite often. It was a place he would meet other prominent members of the town. When he made his way home, he was met by the two British soldiers, Private William Brooks and Sergeant James Buchanan. Private Brooks set upon Joshua, knocking him to the ground before strangling him. Then aided by James Buchanan and Ezra Ross, the three men threw Joshua's body into the well. Bathsheba had achieved what she wanted. Her husband was dead and she would now be able to have her baby without bringing shame on herself. She paid William Brooks and James Buchanan and also gave them clothing that had belonged to Joshua. The two men, along with Ezra Ross, then left Brookfield. However, they did not travel far and stopped in the small town of Worcester, which was only 14 miles away. It had been a while since the two British men had nice new clothes and money in their pockets, so they made their way to the nearest inn and spent the night drinking. The following day, instead of trying to remain inconspicuous and moving on to try and get to a large city where they would be difficult to find, they spoke to the local people and showed off their fine clothes and a silver shoe buckle which was engraved with the initials of Joshua Spooner. Worcester was a town that very much favoured independence, so two British deserters wearing fine clothes and showing off a shoe buckle that had belonged to a wealthy and respectable gentleman was not going to go unnoticed. The authorities were informed and the three men, William Brooks, James Buchanan and Ezra Ross were arrested. Strangely, when questioned, the men did not deny that they had murdered Mr. Joshua Spooner, but told the authorities that it was the deceased gentleman's wife that had planned the crime. They also implicated three of the household servants. Soon Bathsheba Ruggles Spooner was also arrested. William Brooks was charged with the assault of Joshua Spooner. James Buchanan and Ezra Ross were charged with aiding and abetting in the murder. And Mrs. Bathsheba Ruggles Spooner was charged with inciting, abetting and procuring the manner and the form of the murder. The trial began on the 24th of April 1778. It was the first capital trial to be held under the newly formed United States government in Massachusetts. The three household servants who had been implicated as assisting in the murder all testified for the prosecution. Although all of the accused pleaded not guilty, there was little the defence could do as all of the defendants had signed a statement confessing to their part in the crime for which they were being accused. The defence attorney was able to say that Ezra Ross had not carried out Bathsheba's plan to poison her husband and took no part in the assault or murder of the deceased. He had only assisted in the disposal of the body. The defence stated that Ezra was young and he had fought in the battles for independence against the British but had been seduced by Bathsheba a woman twice his age, who had encouraged him to make irrational decisions in order to keep her happy. The trial was the first in America to try and make a plea of insanity. Bathsheba's defence attorney told the court that he believed that she had a distorted mind, her actions were illogical, and her plan to murder her husband could not have been conceived by a rational thinking person. The trial proceedings lasted all day, and no witnesses were called for the defence. The following morning, the jury returned their verdict. The three male defendants were found guilty of murdering Joshua Spooner, and Bathsheba was found guilty of being an accessory to it. All four defendants were sentenced to death. The execution date was set for the 4th of June, 1778. Bathsheba asked that the executions be delayed, telling the authorities that she was with child. She was then examined by a panel of 12 female and 2 male midwives. After the examination, they concluded that she was not in fact pregnant. Bathsheba protested their findings and along with the Reverend Thaddeus McCarty, demanded she be examined again. This time, the midwives reported that in their opinion, Mrs Bathsheba Ruggles Spooner was indeed with child. However, the court did not accept this second opinion and did not seek any further clarification by initiating a further examination. On the 2nd of July, 1778, in Worcester's Washington Square, in front of a crowd of 5,000 people, Mrs. Bathsheba Ruggles Spooner 
was hanged alongside William Brooks, James Buchanan and Ezra Ross. After the execution, a post-mortem was undertaken on Bathsheba. This showed that she had indeed been with child and would have given birth a few months later to a baby boy. Her body was claimed by her sister, Mrs. Mary Ruggles Green, and Bathsheba was buried in an unmarked grave on the Green Estate, which today is the site of Green Hill Park in Worcester, Massachusetts. The actual location of the grave remains unknown. Bathsheba's father, Mr. Timothy Ruggles, had his estates confiscated and fled to Canada. He was named in the Massachusetts Banishment Act, which prevented his return to the States. He settled in Wilmot, Nova Scotia, where in 1779, he received a grant of 10,000 acres of land. He died on the 4th of August, 1795. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, I really do appreciate any feedback or comments you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.